It's another great article. I mean, great-ish. It's from uh, it's the result of the Eater Young Guns Summit, which I was very upset that I couldn't make to. I was one week behind making it to this conference in New York. Another Hillary Dixler Canavan piece, and it's five steps restaurants and diners can take right now to make the industry better. And the subtext, subtext is, quote, in a lot of ways, the restaurant business is broken. Pros Martha Hoover and Davida Davison on how to actually fix it. So I'm going to read them here real quick. And if you want to dive a little bit deeper, the article is always linked up in the show notes or on justincana.com. So step one, operators need to think beyond just getting the best out of their employees. That's interesting. Two, normalize fair conditions and equitable corporate structures. Interesting. Three, start by building the work cult- working culture you want from day one. I 100% believe in that one. Four, consumer culture around pricing must change. Interesting. It's from the same company that employs a guy named Ryan Sutton. Step five, consumers must keep going to restaurants and ask more questions. See if there's any juicy quotes to be pulled out of this. So Davida Davidson is the executive director of Detroit's Food Lab, an organization devoted to supporting and promoting local food businesses. And in that normalizing fair conditions and equitable corporate structures, she says, we try, what we try to do at the early stage is normalize what the restaurant or the food retail of the future is going to look like. We want to normalize what we want to see in the future so there's no baggage or idea of this system we're trying to dismantle. We're trying to teach our way forward. We ask our members that they commit to this methodology called the triple bottom line of accounting. And that means that you're not only paying attention to the P of profit, but you're paying attention to the P in people and the P in planet. So we call it the three P's. It's a good thing that this mo- this mic has a little pop filter on it. That would have been abuse for your ears. Sorry, podcast folks. Anyways, having a profitable business means that you have a profitable business model. I would agree with most of these things. I don't, the thing, the thing that was interesting with me is that most restaurants don't start off knowing that they want to be corporate. I feel like a lot of, it's an ebb and flow, right? If you come from a French laundry style setup where it's a structured restaurant group and there's a million and a half resources and you get frustrated that you aren't able to get ideas put into place because there's xyz gatekeepers in the way of the speed of your creativity sometimes you'll default to going the other way and you want to be a scrappy one door kind of shop you don't want to have a chain of restaurants you want to have your one little boutique atelier you know that you cook out of and you know every single employee's name, and you want it to be small. And so I think there's kind of a critical point in a business where you start to think corporate because the structure is required to keep the wheels spinning. Because if it was scrappy and you had 75 employees, that would be a little bit of a difficult ship to run. And so I understand that. I understand wanting to have corporate structure in place, but I think that it doesn't work for everyone. I think that some people look at corporate structure and it makes them gag. I think that they certain people want to have a little bit more hands-on with everything and they don't want it to be systemized in every single way. There's a great book that I would recommend everybody that wants to start their own thing and it's called The E-Myth Revisited. And it's a great way to think about being an entrepreneur versus a manager. And I suggested it to one of my friends the other day, and I hope that she read it because it was really, really good for me to see the difference between the pros of having a systemized business versus having one that just flies by the seat of its pants. Where you and the great part about it is the author uses the analogy of a pie business, which for us food people is a great way to think about structuring. But he uses that because. It is conducive to getting people to think about the process of making something, their widget, whatever whatever their business is. I did want to dive a little bit into this quote, though. Operators need to think beyond just getting the best out of their employees. Martha Hoover says, quote, In my company, we truly believe that we need to enrich employees' lives. It's more than just offering benefits, more than just offering a beyond livable wage, which we do. It's giving support to life, 
to information that allows people to understand the power that they bring to the table. When you talk about empowering people, it always indicates that I'm giving up some of my power to somebody. I always like to remind people, at least when they're within our four walls, they come in with a lot of power and knowledge. Hmm. I guess I understand that. We have a 24-hour, 365-day-a-year employee assistance plan that offers free legal, free psychological, drug, and alcohol testing and counseling. Things like that show people that we care about you, not just when you're engaged at work. We care about you as a whole person. Be interested to see how... What was his name? Follow him on Twitter. He had a whole program talking about that. Do any of you folks have organizations that come in at your restaurant and do something like that? Whether it's like a employee assistance program or something that you've taken advantage of recently that's been like, whoa, I'm really glad that my company does this. Because I'm always concerned with how something looks like getting on your high horse and talking about and how something gets received by an actual employee in a restaurant. If you've taken advantage of something like that and you have really found some benefit into it, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on how that's gone for you. Because it certainly didn't exist when I was coming up. I mean, we had 401k options and insurance, but not access to therapy. So I'm all about it. I'm all about these conversations happening. I just think changing consumer psychology is difficult. And what we want in our moral obligations and what ultimately gets translated into what happens in the market can often be different. Quote, you have to be very cognizant of where you spend your dollar. When you do spend your dollar at these places, you have to be very cognizant of what they look like. These are things you can't be do- you can be doing on a daily basis. End quote. Really sad I missed that whole panel. I would love... Th- Although, listening to panels like this definitely gets me excited about having certain people like this on the podcast. Because I really don't shy away from getting into the nitty-gritty with some of these things, with some of these people. <laughs>